Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's garage, I thought I would take a few moments to give you some of my current thinking on issues surrounding the COVID-19 virus. Opinions are cheap and plentiful, and mine is no better or more qualified than any other you might come across on the internet. I am, however, a Facebook community forum moderator, which makes me, therefore, an expert in matters such as constitutional law and epidemiology. In all seriousness, though, because the forum itself is largely populated with COVID information right now, I am reasonably up to date on a wide spectrum of information, statistics, opinion, and news releases related to the matter. The focus of what I'm going to talk to you about today is flattening the curve and why it's so important. And I'm going to do it without any fancy math, or even any curves. And I'm afraid I must also disabuse some folks, or at least some of their older relatives, of the notion that we will defeat the virus, or avoid it, or prevent it, or that it's going to be like a bad flu season. Second, I want to talk about the likely toll it will take. And third, I want to address the only knob we have to turn, which is the speed with which the virus propagates. Controlling the rate of exposure is how we flatten the demand curve for healthcare, and that is the key. So as far as defeating the virus goes, that's impossible at this point. Unless science suddenly comes up with a pharmaceutical cure or vaccine, modern medicine has unfortunately very little to offer when it comes to the coronavirus, except supportive care like putting you on a ventilator. Beyond that, you get better on your own, just like you did back in 1918, or you don't. Remember that the common cold is also a coronavirus, and you'd feel a little silly pinning your hopes on an imminent cure for the common cold, and it's largely the same deal with this one. We may eventually get a vaccine, but that will only be effective as long as the virus doesn't sufficiently mutate. And so, absent a vaccine, which even if it does arrive, will take a year at best to do so, we're going to ride this one out together as a global population. Our experiences will be different depending on our specific country's national infrastructure, its policies, healthcare, and so on, but we will all get exposed eventually. Those who do get exposed to the virus will develop the infection and require care at about the same rate everywhere in the world, and in accordance with their own health and risk factors. If we can't defeat the virus, then why are we trying? Why are we prohibiting travel and entry and closing schools if we can't win? That's because the whole point is to slow the spread so that we flatten that curve, which is just a fancy way of saying that we want to prevent everyone getting sick at the same time, because the healthcare system would be massively overloaded if that happens. In that case, you would be stuck with home care, and if you got to the point of requiring IV fluids, oxygen, or a ventilator, you'd likely die at home. That's the situation we want to avoid, because that will massively escalate the suffering and the death rate. If we delay the spread and slow the rate at which people get exposed to the virus, then we slow the rate at which they get infected and become sick. That spreads out the demand for healthcare so that everyone doesn't show up at the hospital at the same time, only to be turned away or parked in a hallway to die, as we're already seeing in portions of Italy. I promise no fancy math, and so here are numbers you can check on your own with a Happy Meal calculator. Most of my numbers come from the American Hospital Association. There are about 325 million people in the USA. Conservative estimates are that 30% of them will get COVID-19 eventually, or about 100 million people before it finally runs its course, no matter how long that ultimately takes. As many as one in seven of those will need hospitalization, or about 14 million people. That's only 4% of the population, a pretty conservative guess. And yet, there are only 1 million hospital beds in the USA. That's 14 sick people competing for each and every hospital bed. And it's not as though those hospital beds are empty now, just ready for extra patients. Typically, one in five of those patients that's sick enough to need the hospital will need the ICU, or about one million people. That's a tiny ratio, a mere one-third of one percent of our population. And there are 95,000 ICU beds in the USA, but with a million people needing them, that's ten very sick people vying for every ICU bed. If nine of them get turned away, they will likely perish. In that case, the doctor's job may be one of triage and deciding who has the best chance of living and not who needs care the most. As a more concrete example, there just aren't enough respirators for everyone who would need one either. And even ignoring capacity issues, we'd probably run out of IV bags and masks and gloves and other essentials too. You might have heard that this is like a bad flu season. Let's parse what that means as we keep in mind that we already lose about 40,000 people a year from regular influenza. And I question whether it logically follows that it's therefore acceptable to lose additional lives on top to something else entirely. Influenza deaths don't inform whether I wear a seatbelt either, even though car accidents kill about the same number every year. That aside, to say such a thing is a bit dismissive about the scale. The most common, typically conservative scientific opinion I've heard on this is that it will be about 10 times that of the typical influenza season. That's 400,000 people. 
If that's the conservative view, what's the more pessimistic view? If COVID turned out to have a death rate similar to that of the 1918 flu, we would lose about 2 million people. And that's million with a big M. That's simply never happened before in our modern history. Much, much worse has happened many times in recorded history, though. Some of the historically documented influenza outbreaks of the 16th century left some European cities described as essentially depopulated. This will absolutely not be that. And don't let anyone scare you into thinking it will be. It's not the Andromeda strain. Even with a horrific death rate, 98% of people would survive. There'd be no empty cities, no dystopian future. But since estimates are that 100 million people will eventually contract the virus, even if it's a super mild case, an easy way to predict the stats is to assume 1 million deaths per percent of the fatality rate. When we know that number more authoritatively, we'll be able to predict more accurately. Currently, as of March 12th, 4,700 people have died from 128,000 confirmed infections, or a rate of more than 3.5%. If that rate were actually what transpired here in America, we would have 3.5 million deaths. But the death rate really cannot be that high, because there are no doubt many more actual cases than have actually been confirmed, meaning the death rate is nowhere near that 3.5%. That is also the current World Health Organization estimate, 3.4%, but that's again based on confirmed cases. The other problem is that such a number serves as only an upper bound. Only in time will we know what the actual number is, and it will be a lot less than 3.5 million people. But if the deaths from 9-11 were more than any of us could bear, how can we be flippant about whether it's only 100 or 1,000 times as many people? And that's why calling it a bad flu season is a bit perplexing to me. Once community spread was confirmed in the USA, which was arguably inevitable once it escaped Wuhan, there was nothing that anyone in any position could do to stop or prevent the spread. And there's nothing that can be done now except to use our modern resources to slow the contagion rate. If you're wondering why they were able to stop SARS and they were not able to stop COVID, the basic reason is that COVID appears much more contagious, and it's potentially transmissible for several days before you show any symptoms. With SARS, they could isolate cases that developed symptoms, and they weren't transmissible until after that point. With COVID, that's proven impossible. My goal is not to simply spook you with large numbers, however. It is to remind you that the only knob any of us had to turn in this case, whether you were the President of the United States or a kid staying home from elementary school in Saskatchewan, is how fast people get exposed and infected. The slower, the better, and that's why social distancing and closing schools and not visiting grandma and so on makes actual sense. It slows the speed. Just like 1918, we will someday look back and be able to say that some percentage of people overall were infected. In 1918, it was again 30%, which is the number I've been using here. There's almost nothing we can do to change that number, whatever it does turn out to be. All we can do is flatten the curve and slow the inevitable spread so that people that need a hospital bed or a respirator have a shot at getting one when they need it, which will in turn significantly improve the overall survival. I'd like to say something clever like, your job is not to panic. And while that is true, it's also important that you follow the social distancing, self-quarantine, and other official recommendations, all of which are designed to, again, flatten that curve by slowing the spread. If you felt this video made some common garage style sense compared to some of the hype and nonsense you've seen and read, I'd appreciate it if you'd share it with your friends on Facebook or text them a link to this video. Thanks for considering it. From homeschool to being prepped to the science of wet markets and how this affects the stock market, there's a lot more I'd like to cover if there is sufficient interest. Thanks for stopping by Dave's Garage.